you guys know I like being straight with you. I'm a bit burnt out from YouTube right now, so today we're going to be doing something a little more different. Today, you and I are going to be searching the internet for some cool baseball stories. That's pretty much it. That's the entire video. Alright, so we're here on Reddit. We got a story from this guy. Uh, let's see. On June 7th, 1884, ace pitcher Charlie Sweeney set a major league record that would stand for 102 years, when he struck out 19 batters in a single game. After this game, however, arm trouble put him on the bench, putting the bulk of the Providence Grays' innings on the back of Old Haas Radburn, who was the Grays' only other pitcher of note. Radburn complained, and eventually Sweeney was forced to take the mound again. What followed is possibly the most old-timey baseball story in existence. That sounds fun. After a game in Woonsocket Ro- that, that's a place. After a game in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, Sweeney got drunk and elected to stay in Woonsocket with a lady friend. Ooh. Waking the next morning, still drunk, and realizing that he had to start in Providence, he rushed out the door. With an already tight pitching staff, the Grace had no choice but to put the visibly hammered Sweeney on the mound. They tried to pull him after five effective innings, but Sweeney was having none of it. This was a time where pitching anything less than a complete game brought your very manliness into question. He pitched another two against the wishes of his manager. When again they tried to pull him before the 8th with the threat of a $50 fine. Ooh, that's a lot of money back then. Sweeney told them to stuff their $50 fine and his whole contract. He walked off the field and watched the rest of the game with a woman in each arm. <laughs> this not only got him kicked off the team, but thrown out of the entire National League. Wow. And that only sets up the final twist of this story, so there's more. With the Grays being extremely understaffed, Old Haas Radburn offered to pitch the remaining games of the season for a small pay bump and an exemption from the reserve clause. He started 40 of the remaining 43 games in the season and won 36 of them, holy crud. His arm became sore enough that he couldn't raise it over his shoulders and he had to warm up for hours before game time just to get the ball to the plate. Just to add to his spectacular feat, Radburn started and won every single game of the 1884 World Series. Oh my goodness. I'd barely heard of this guy before this. After an incredible 670, wow, that's a lot of innings, Radburn amassed an official 59 wins for the season, sometimes reported as 60, an impossible record that will never be touched. And it's all because a man named Charlie Sweeney got laid on July 21st, 1884. Wow, that's a story. Uh, there was a guy in the 1930s who got sent home during the season for being a crazy bleep then tried to hijack the plane he was flying on, was hit over the head with a blunt object by the pilot, and what? Leonard George Konecki uh, was an American baseball player who played Major League Baseball for the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants. He died of a blow to the head at the hands of the pilot and a passenger of a plane of which he seized control? Excuse me? After being sent home from the road trip, Kenneke caught a commercial flight for New York City. During the flight, he drank a quart of whiskey and became very drunk. After Kenneke had harassed other passengers and struck a stewardess, the pilot had to sit on him to restrain him as he was shackled- what? He was removed unconscious from the flight in Detroit. After sleeping on a chair at the airport, he chartered a flight to Toronto in the hopes of rejoining the Bisons. While flying over Canada, he had a disagreement with the pilot and the passenger and attempted to- Oh my goodness. This got dark pretty quick. Basically any story about Rube Waddle. That's a name. All right. Uh, Key Lime Pie has a nice bullet point list of crazy Rube Waddle information. He missed the 1905 World Series after injuring his shoulder while trying to destroy a straw hat. Wow. During exhibition games, he would often tell his teammates to leave the field, strike out the side, then cartwheel or somersault back to the dugout. He was paid only in ones on an as-needed basis so that he couldn't blow it all on booze. His contract prohibited him from eating crackers in bed. He was suspended for five games for climbing into the stands to attack a fan. Once he was at bat and an errant pickoff throw went into center field. The runner tried to score on the play and when the ball came into home plate from the outfield, Waddle hit it back into play. He once missed a game because he decided to play marbles with some kids on the street on his- Okay, this guy isn't real. There's no way. This guy is a, a total Sid Finch. Uh, Rube Waddle. I, I don't buy that this person existed. I don't buy it at all. Oh my god, he's real. Dude, Rube Waddle. Ladies man. He's the man of legend. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna say it right now, Rube Waddle deserves his own video. I don't know if anybody in the baseball community has covered him before. I'm gonna do some research after I make this video, and if not, consider 
this video in the works. I definitely want to read more on Rube Waddle and uh, relay the information to you guys. Ty Cobb hated the whole Homer craze in the 1920s with people flocking to see bombs instead of well-placed bunts and slap singles. Ty Cobb would definitely hate the game today. He thought it took less skill to hit home runs. To prove his point, he told the reporter, quote, I'll show you something today. I'm going for home runs for the first time in my career. At the age of 38 in Sportsman Park, he went six for six with three homers and a double. The next day, he clubbed two more homers. His five homers in two consecutive games was something that had never been done before, not even by the great Babe Ruth. Having proven his point, he went back to his old lifestyle of slap singles and well-placed bunts. Wow. Hats off to Ty Cobb, he truly was one of the best. All right, this one is, what is your favorite story of baseball lore? In 1987, a minor league catcher named Dave Breshinon sculpted a potato to look like a baseball. In the fifth inning, he put the potato in his mitt. He caught a pitch and then attempted a pickoff throw to third with, with the potato. He deliberately threw errantly, sending the spud into the outfield. The runner broke for home where Breshinen tagged him with the real baseball. The incident ended Breshinen's career, but what I wouldn't give to have seen the thing <laughs> to have happened live. That, that's pretty funny. Yeah, okay, apparently this, this actually happened. So I'm trying my best to back up some of the stories that I read. This, this definitely happened. I can see a bunch of stories on it. That's pretty hilarious. I love that. Ted Williams playing for the Cleveland Indians in 1948. Uh, oh, sorry. Ted Williams was playing for the Cleveland Indians in 1948 and finally faced off against Satchel Paige. Williams had been a fan of Paige for a long time, but once he stepped into the box and saw Paige's motion and delivery firsthand, he was even more impressed. Late in the game, Paige had two strikes on Williams, but as Paige went into his windup, Ted saw Satchel's grip on the ball and could tell that a curveball was coming. A few tenths of a second later, Williams watched the fastball go right down the middle for strike three. Page had shown him the curveball grip on purpose, then changed it in mid-delivery. Wow. The next day, Page sought out Williams before the game. Peering into the Red Sox dugout, he caught Ted's eye, smiled, and said, You ought to know better than to guess with all Satch. That's a pretty good story. That's a feel-good story. Gaylord Perry's manager stating in 1964 that, quote, They'll put a man on the moon before Gaylord Perry hits a home run. On July 20th, 1969, Perry hit his first career home run 20 minutes after the Apollo landing. Oh, apparently that was debunked. Never mind. In 1912, the Detroit Tigers staged a walkout after, oh, Ty Cobb again, was suspended by the team for climbing into the stands and attacking a man in a wheelchair who had been heckling him. AL President Ban Johnson, that's a name, threatened the Tigers with a $5,000 fine for every game in which they didn't feel the team. So Tigers manager Huey Jennings was ordered to go find enough players to feel the team for that day's game in Philadelphia. Oh boy. Jennings patrolled the streets of Philadelphia and ran into Alan Travers, a 20-year-old violinist studying at St. Joseph's. Travers was ordered to round up as many fellows as he could to come play for the Tigers, with each man receiving $25 for playing. Travers agreed to pitch when he was told that the pitcher would receive 50 bucks. Jennings, along with assistant coaches Deacon McGuire and Joe Sugden, filled out the lineup. Oh my god. Travers pitched a complete game that day, allowing just 26 hits and walking only 7 in a 24-2 loss to the Athletics. Only 14 of those runs were earned, though, because the defense made 7 errors. Okay. He was instructed to throw only slow curves, as Jennings was afraid that if he threw fastballs, he might get killed. <laughs> the star of the game for the Tigers was Ed Irwin, who went 2 for 3 with 2 triples in his only Major League appearance. Not bad, not bad. Irwin finished his career with a 2.667 OPS, that's gotta be the best in Major League history. After the game, Ban Johnson was so angry that he met with the Tigers and told them that they'd all be banned for life if they skipped another game. Cobb told his teammates to stand down and the temporary Tigers all went back to their normal lives. <laughs> oh man, that's so funny. Now let's see if this story checks out. Alan Travers, Tigers. Uh, wow, okay, he's in baseball reference. I'm gonna... Negative 0.5 war. Eight innings pitched, one strikeout. He has a whip above four. It's gotta be in the same ballpark as 2019 April Jason Vargas. Okay, this is the second time I've seen the Doc Ellis no-hitter on LSD. So we're gonna go and we're gonna do what any sane-minded individual would do. And we are going to look this up. Okay. Okay, Sports Illustrated covered it. Definitely happened, so we got that. On June 12, 1970, Pirates pitcher Doc Ellis did something that, by all rights, should be completely impossible. 
He went and threw a no-hitter despite being high as a kite on <laughs> lysergic acid diethylamide. I'm a physics major, not a chem major. This is, this is ridiculous. Lysergic acid diethylamide. Ah, forget it. Otherwise known as acid. Facing the Padres at the old San Diego Stadium, Ellis took the mound having dropped acid earlier that day and blanked the Friars. It was the first and only no-hitter of Ellis's career, and almost certainly the lone MLB no-hitter pitched under the influence of LSD. Uh, that's all I'm going to read for this one. <laughs> wow, that's, I did not think that was even possible. Oh my god, this this um, Clarence Brethren story. I remember Mike mentioning this in one of his um, old injury videos. I think he made this like a year and a half ago. This was OG, I guess. Um, maybe this is where he got it from. Uh, Clarence Brethren had false teeth, and the only time he got on base, he slipped his teeth into his pocket. When he slid into second base, his pocketed teeth tore a chunk of skin from his blank. This made Clarence the only player to go on the DL by biting his own blank. That's hilarious. I, and yeah, Mike did cover this. I remember that. All right, Scientist TZ. In 1994, White Sox manager Gene Lamont challenged Albert Bell's bat with the allegation that it was corked. The umpire confiscated the bat and put it in the umpire's locker room, which was locked. One of the Indians relief pitchers broke into the umpire's room through the ceiling and switched the cork bat with another player's bat. Evidence of the break-in was noticed though and the Indians had to turn the bat over to Major League Baseball. Bell got suspended but the guy who broke into the locker room was unknown until he confessed years later. Then MLB went on strike and ate a- okay I'm not reading that part that's a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> yep Gene Lamont's a real person that's all the proof I need that it existed. All right, this was a pretty different video. Um, those were some cool stories that we uh, discovered together. Um, you can let me know what you thought about them down below. I'll also, like I said, leave the link to that Reddit thread with those interesting stories. I didn't cover all of them um, for different reasons and some I just completely skipped through. So if you wanna go look at all those yourself, you can definitely go in there. It's definitely an interesting Reddit thread. If you guys wanna see more of these, you can let me know down in the comment section below. Um, these are much, much easier to make than even my analysis videos, which take pretty much like two days constant editing and producing. It just ends up being like 20 hours a time, so um, I can definitely do more of these if you want. They're much easier to make, like I said, so I can make more of them if you like this more informal type of video. So like I said, let me know in the comment section. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, that's going to be it for me today. I will see you in the next video. I want to thank you all very much for watching this far and I will talk to you in another video very, very soon. Thanks for watching.